Uh, we are 32 weeks in to what is a year-long 50-week series where we are going through the entire Bible from cover to cover throughout the course of this year as a church. And that may sound neat. It may sound altruistic, but it's not an exercise I wanted us to do because it sounds cool or it sounds good or it sounds like something we ought to do. There was huge, huge purpose behind this. And that is, that is because of this. Without proper context, without a better understanding of what's happening in the Hebrew Scriptures, back in, in what we call the Old Testament oftentimes, it's easy to miss so much of what is happening in and through the life of Jesus and the New Testament. And, and, and the New Testament's a place where a lot of us are comfortable. A lot of us have spent way more time in the New Testament than we have in the Old Testament. And yet, even without that, that foundation that is the Old Testament and really knowing it well, you're going to miss so much that's there in the Gospels. Uh, last week, we spent some time in the prophet Malachi, who was the, the last and the latest prophet in the Old Testament. And God said something important there in Malachi that I, I don't want us to miss. He said this. He says, I, the Lord, do not change. I do not change. And I think that's important for us. Because a lot of times as Christians, we, we kind of develop or have this, this differing view of the God of the Hebrew Scriptures or the God of the Old Testament from the God of the New Testament. Where we kind of view God as, as back then being this, this angry or petulant or vengeful God who somehow later becomes this, this gracious and gentle and patient and loving God. Have you ever seen anyone kind of take that, that perspective between these two halves of the Bible, so to speak? But what I want us to see is that the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are the same God. That's what he tells Malachi. I do not change. And he's a God that, that, that loves us and has loved us from the beginning of time. And so uh, that, that mindset should inform, I think, how we view the Hebrew Scriptures now in the rearview mirror as we look back on everything we've been reading for the last 31 weeks and we jump into today. Uh, in 2017, Lifeway Research polled Americans on, on how much of the Bible they've actually read. And uh, as it turns out, Americans, as you might imagine, are, are quite fond of the Bible. But it, it may or may not surprise you that, that more than 50% of Americans indicated that they'd read nothing more than a few passages or a few stories here and there. Um, they, they had never read actually the whole thing. And in fact, only one in five Americans indicated that they'd read the entire Bible. So why do I bring this up? It's because if, if all the average person does is focus on, you know, a few parables that Jesus shared or a few little stories here and there, those quotable phrases that, that fit really well onto a graphic on social media, we're going to miss the depth and the beauty and the intentionality that is woven throughout, particularly here in the Gospels, particularly in the New Testament. So why is today an exciting day? It's because after 31 weeks of laying that foundation, for everything that is to come, today is the day that the cornerstone begins to be laid and we finally get to build on that foundation that was there for thousands and thousands of years. And so let's go to God in a word of prayer. And as we do, I want to be thinking about that song that we just sang. Do you believe that God is a great God? Do you love God with all your heart? Church, this is not rhetorical. Do you love God that much? Do you believe he's a great God? then let's, let's revere him as the great God that he is. If you can, stand or kneel. Let's raise hands to that God. Let's praise him in prayer. There's a lot for us to be praying about right now, a lot for us to be praying about. John touched on some of it. I'm going to touch on more of it. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, Holy Spirit, we want to we wanna welcome you into this place, Father. We want to ask that you would be present with us this morning. And we ask today as we get into your word that you would show us and reveal new things in your word to us that we've never seen before. And that we wouldn't just use whatever we've learned as head knowledge that we just hold on to and, and do nothing with, Father. But I pray that what we learn today does something, something that, that only you can do, not something that I, I planned on doing, not something I'm trying to, to coerce anybody into, but Father, just that your Holy Spirit would move us however you need to move us, to change us, to shape us, to guide us, and to show us how to be more like Jesus today. As I prayed this week on Facebook, I'm, I'm mindful not only of those in Afghanistan, but specifically those 
who are our brothers and sisters in Christ in Afghanistan, who are suffering, who are facing uh, persecution, who are facing death right now. I, I pray that you would be with them and, and protect them in mighty and powerful and miraculous ways, Father. I pray for, for people like Crystal's boss and my brother-in-law and my niece and, and others who have, have come down with COVID and, and pray that you would protect them and heal them as they need it, Father. I, I ask that uh, personally. I ask that corporately for us. There are, are plenty of people. I, I'm, I'm mindful of, of Ricardo today who's been having to isolate because he was exposed and he doesn't have it, but we just pray that, that he's able to, to come out and, and, and worship with us again soon. I'm mindful of people like my mom who, who today had a scare and, and thought that she might have had COVID and doesn't, and I praise you for that. But Father, that's heavy on my heart. And so this morning, I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that there are a lot of us going through a lot of different things right now. Some of us, like Mark, are starting new careers, and, and they're, they're embracing fatherhood and motherhood for the first time and moving again. And so I, I pray for them. I, I pray for, for those who feel like they need to stay home right now and ask that, that the church continue to rally around them and, and support them and love them. Father, there's just so much. I feel like I'm drowning in, in, in reasons to, to come to you on, on my knees and pray to you, Father. And so I, I just pray that as we're in this place this morning, that any tendency we have to just kind of have our Bible open and our app open and, you know, maybe be halfway there, maybe not. Father, would you help us to just be fully engaged? I pray for fire. I pray that you would light a fire within our heart, within our souls for you, that we would be madly in love with you with a fraction of the love that you show us. Father, would you, would you come to life in this place today? Would you bless this church? Would you bless your church throughout San Francisco and the Bay Area and help us to be lights in, in a place that needs your light? This is my prayer in Jesus' holy name. Amen. You guys can be seated. Thank you. Uh, by a show of hands, how many of you remember what it was like before we had maps embedded into our phones and the dashboards in our car that told us how to get wherever it was that we needed to go? Yeah. Uh, I was thinking about that this week, uh, thinking about how much has changed or how much changed around 1996 or 1997 with uh, the, the invention of MapQuest. How many of you remember using MapQuest.com to get to places? Maybe you saw a little printout like this. It was kind of, a, kind of a revolutionary time where you could go onto your computer and you could type in an address and all of a sudden you could print out directions that looked like this and they would take you to wherever it was that you needed to go. I, I think we take it for granted now, but back then that was a mighty, mighty big deal. And so because of MapQuest, if we wanted to give someone to our, to directions to our house prior to that time, prior to that date. It was, a, it was a very, very different kind of experience. We had all these landmarks. We had all these things that we, we would point out to you along the way for you to look for. And so we, we might say, okay, friend, you're, you're going to get off at the Main Street exit, and you're going to head east down that road. And about a mile down, you're going to see this Taco Bell, and you're going to turn left at the Taco Bell, and then the, the road's going to kind of veer right, and then it's going to veer left, and you're going to come in a roundabout, and make sure you take the second right in the roundabout, not the first right, or you'll end up in the wrong spot. And then once you do that, you're going to go down three or four blocks, and you'll see a house with a big oak tree, and there's a, a tree house there. Make sure you turn left there, and then take the next right, and you know, we'll be the third blue house on the left, and you can, you can tell because there's going to be an old station wagon on blocks in the driveway. Like, that's our house. How many of you remember giving and getting directions that sounded kind of like that? Meanwhile, your friend's on the phone, kind of listening, trying to write all this down, going, okay, turn, turn left at the, at the redwood tree, right? And they're like, no, 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 oak tree. If you turn at the redwood tree, you might end up, you know, in front of old man McGee's house, and he might call the cops on you for looking suspicious. Make sure it's the oak tree. And it sounds crazy, but if you're a certain age, you, you remember what that was like. You remember what those directions sounded like. And so... Uh, if, if you do remember those times, then you're probably in a great place to be able to appreciate some of where we're going today. Uh, if you don't remember those times, and there's probably plenty of you in, in this room as well, my kids included, try to imagine what life might have been like before MapQuest and TomTom Tom and Garmin and Google Maps and all that stuff. Because as we left off last week in the prophet Malachi, we found ourselves with a bit of a cliffhanger. 
And the cliffhanger was a promise. It was a promise that one day in the future, two people would come. One comes to prepare the way for the other, and the other comes with a promise that they're going to establish this new and everlasting covenant. And when the second person comes, God says through Malachi, he says, on the day when I act, all the, the people who listened, all the people who heard, all the people who cared, he says, they will be my treasured possession. And I will spare them just as a father has compassion and spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who don't. And so as those final words of Malachi were written, and as the, the Hebrew scriptures of the Old Testament come to a close last week, that was, that was essentially the cliffhanger that God left for his people. And with those words ending for hundreds of years, there was silence. For hundreds of years, there, there was, there was no, no word from God that, that we know of. No, no prophet was speaking. There's no scripture given. Nothing. But as I mentioned last week, eventually that, that silence does end and the voice of God begins to speak to the people once again. But this time, when he does, the world has changed drastically. It is a much, much different place than when Malachi left off. Because when Malachi left off last week, the people of God living in this, this promised land, if you will, that they called home, were, were living under the reign and power of the Persian Empire, some, sometimes called the Persians and the Medes. But all of that begins to change in about 331 BC. Because in 331 BC, the Persian Empire falls to the king of Macedon, a guy by the name of Alexander. You may have heard of him. He's, he's otherwise known as Alexander the Great. And suddenly God's people find themselves living under an entirely different regime, an entirely different empire. We might otherwise call this the Greek Empire. And as that empire kind of grows and evolves, eventually another significant leader comes, uh, you know, kind of takes over at some point in the future. We spoke about him last week briefly. His name is Antiochus Epiphanes. And in about 168 BC, uh, there's a small little revolt that comes because Antiochus had appointed a high priest. It wasn't the people, it was the, the, the emperor, if you will. He had appointed a high priest and they rejected him. And this so angered Antiochus that he came back to Jerusalem, he attacked the city, he killed tons and tons of people. And after he was done, uh, the book of 1 Maccabees describes how Antiochus went into the temple and proceeded to take all of the furnishings, all of the holy things, the, the, the altar that, that Thomas was talking about and, and, and more. And, and there he, he, they, he desecrates the most holy of places. He desecrates this holy temple of God. And then about 20 years after that, in a battle called the, the Battle of Corinth, the, the rising Roman Empire finally grows and defeats the Greeks and takes over what had been Greek territory. Now, I, I can see there's a lot more details in here than I'm giving you right now, but this is kind of the, the big nuts and bolts. And so by the time the New Testament begins, the Persians have fallen, the Greeks have, have risen and fallen, and now the mighty Roman Empire has been in power for, for roughly 150 years. And what's fascinating about all of this, as we read Daniel just a, just a couple of weeks ago, Daniel actually spoke about this. He spoke about this kind of parade of empires that was going to be coming down the pipeline. He talked about it in Daniel 8 and Daniel 10 and Daniel 11 and so on. So a lot has happened in the world between Malachi and Matthew, even though in your Bible it turned one page. You turn one page from, from Malachi to Matthew to start the New Testament. But, but so much has changed in the world. But the one common denominator... The one unifying factor of all those years is the reality that this, this state that God's people are in, this, this world that they're all living in, is not the kind of future that God has promised for his people. And so in the very same breath that God spoke of the fall of Persia, and he spoke of the, the rise and fall of Greece and so on, he, he also pointed ahead to a future figure, someone who was to come that, that in, in 77s, if you remember that Daniel language, or roughly 490 years, there would be this anointed one, this Messiah who would come and confirm a covenant and put an end once and for all to sacrifice and offering. This is all the things that, that Daniel was talking about a couple of weeks ago. And so the people of God are, are, are sitting there and they're, they're hoping 
And they're waiting, and they're hoping, and they're waiting, and they're hoping, and they're waiting for this better future, this coming Messiah that was promised to them. Now, if you've read the Bible before, or have even the, the slightest understanding of what's happening in it, it's no secret that, that Matthew is the, the first gospel in our New Testaments. It's one of four books that begin to tell the story of Jesus' life. But I want you for a moment, if you can, to sort of take off those Christian lenses, those Christian glasses, and begin to put on some of the Jewish lenses and Jewish glasses, because I want you to, to put yourself in the shoes of somebody who's eagerly waiting for what's to come. Think, think about yourself in their shoes. What, what would you want to know about this person who's getting ready to come? What, what would you want to find out? What would you want to understand? What would be important to you as you wait for this figure to come that you don't know a whole lot about? And it kind of reminds me uh, of a movie that, that came out when I was in high school. Uh, in 1998, there was this movie that came out that kind of blew everybody's minds. And it was one of those classic movies that will probably stand the test of time, uh, at least throughout my lifetime. Raise your hand if you've ever seen the movie The Matrix. Have you ever seen The Matrix? Few people in this room, fewer than I thought, surprisingly. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a classic movie. And uh, in its day, it, it, was, it was a sight and a story to behold. It was something that kind of was mind-blowing. But you'll remember that in the movie, there was this prophecy about someone who was to come. They didn't know his name. They didn't know what he looked like. They didn't even know if he was a he. All they knew was that this, this person was supposed to come, and that person would fix all of the brokenness that was in their world. But the lingering question for them all was who was this person? Who was the one? What would they do? What would they look like? How would they behave? They had some hints, they had some ideas from things maybe they'd read or things maybe they'd heard, but, but they didn't emphatically know what this person was going to look like. And so as, as you meet Neo, the, the main character, if you will, that's kind of the tension that's there throughout the whole story. Is Neo the one or not? In fact, if you take the, the letters of Neo and kind of rearrange them, what do you get? One, right? <clears throat> and so you quickly realize not everybody's in agreement about whether Neo is the one or not. Some, some are willing to risk their lives in this full, sold-out belief in Neo. And yet others, others are, are far more skeptical. They think maybe he's a fake. They think he's average. They think he's normal, that he's not special. He's just like any other person. And so that, that, that same kind of lingering question and tension that we see in that movie, I think, is very much present in the background of the gospel accounts. I think it's probably where the Matrix gets their plot idea from. The question is, is this Jesus who's come, the, the, the anointed one? Is he the Christ? Is he the Messiah? Is he the one that Daniel and all of the other prophets that we've been reading about for hundreds of years were speaking about? Is this the one? Well, if you were the one asking that question, how would you begin to answer it? How would you, how would you clarify whether he was indeed the one? Well, I think you would do so in much the same way that you would stand in front of your friend's house and go, okay, is, is this actually the house that I was given directions to? And so you might look and say, yeah, there's a station wagon on blocks in the driveway. That checks out. And you might kind of peek down the street. It's a third blue house on the left. And you ask, okay, did, did I pass the, the oak tree with the, the tree house? Yeah, I did that. Did I take the second ride at the roundabout? Yeah, I did that. And so once you answered all of those questions, you, you could begin to say with some confidence, yeah, this, this, is, this is where I'm supposed to be. This is indeed my friend's house. I know that because everything else around it checks out. And so when Matthew begins in Matthew chapter 1, what do you see? You see this list of 42 generations. It's a genealogy of Jesus. But what I want you to see and understand is it's more than just a convenient catalog of generations that led up to this Jesus guy who's coming. What this is, is, is a master class. It's a master class that sets out to answer the question, is Jesus really the one? Is he really the Messiah? And so what does Matthew say right off the bat in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1? This is the genealogy of Jesus, the, help me out, Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Immediately, Matthew wants you to understand exactly what he's doing. And a lot of the names, many of the names <coughs> that he's getting ready to list are like hyperlinks to him. How many of you use the internet before, right? You understand what a hyperlink is or what a link is? It, it's, it's one page that kind of connects to another page. Well, these are like hyperlinks. And so these names 
are, are the links to, to various people and places throughout the entirety of the Hebrew scriptures that we just read. Pardon me, I'm going to get a drink of water. So we've been reading all these names, and, and we've been reading the Hebrew scriptures where God's speaking about a, a future figure who is to come, who's prophesied, and so on. And so when you look at this list of names in Matthew chapter 1, you realize the fact that Abraham is there matters, and Isaac matters, and Jacob matters, and, and Judah, and Tamar, and Boaz, and Ruth, and Jesse, and David, and Solomon, and Rehoboam, and Josiah, all of these names that we've been reading for 31 weeks, they're all hugely significant and understanding what, what is getting ready to happen in Jesus' life. But the two biggest ones that I want to point out and focus on briefly are the ones that are highlighted right here in, in the very first verse of Matthew chapter 1. And they're Abraham and David. Now, why Abraham and David? Well, these two stand out from all the others because they happen to be people that God made a covenant with, which is people he made a promise to. It's like a contract. It's an unbreakable promise that God made to these two men. And so thousands of years before Jesus ever breathed his very first breath, what does God say to Abraham? Well, if you have the ability to flip over there quickly, we can look at Genesis chapter 17. <coughs> so God speaks to Abraham way, 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 way back in Genesis. And he says, as for me, Abraham, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. He says, I will make you very fruitful I will make nations come of you, nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. So essentially, he says, Abraham, even though you are childless right now, if you remember his story, you know he's, he's childless for some period of time, even though you're childless right now, not only will you have more descendants than you can possibly imagine, but I'm, I promise you even kings are going to come from your descendants. And to your descendants, I will be their God, and they will be my people. And so 14 generations later, God delivers on part of that promise. And he raises up that very first king from a lowly shepherd with a slingshot into a mighty warrior after God's own heart, who's named king, and that king is King David. And to King David... He would make another covenant. And this time it's in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. He says, David, when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood. And I will establish his kingdom, and he is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom. How long? Forever. He continues, he says, your house and your kingdom will endure how long? Forever. Your throne will be established how long? Forever. Guess what? Go like this. It took two generations, two generations for his family to lose control of the throne of Israel. That doesn't sound like forever, right? So was God lying? Was God wrong? Or... Did he have in mind a different kind of king and a different kind of kingdom, one that, that never falls, maybe one that lasts for eternity? Church, the reality is that the more you dig into these first two chapters of Matthew, the more Matthew demonstrates exactly who this Jesus is and why he is indeed the Messiah. The genealogy demonstrates it. The covenants demonstrate it. The prophets that we've been reading for however long, however many weeks, these last several weeks, demonstrate it. Case in point, what did Micah say? If any of you read Micah, Micah chapter 5, verse 2. He says, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. So to Micah, he said the Messiah is going to come from the tribe of Judah, He's going to be born in Bethlehem, and he's going to rule over Israel. Well, look at Matthew chapter 1, verse 3. 
Look at Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Look at Matthew chapter 2, verse 2, and what do you see? Are those, are those predictions true? Go like this. Yeah. What about Isaiah? What did Isaiah say? This is chapter 7, verse 14. He says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So in other words, the, the Messiah is going to be born of a virgin, and it's not going to be like God near us, or God speaks to us, or God sees us, or God hears us, but God is with us. And so what do you see in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23? Or how about Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1? A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, from his roots, a branch will bear fruit. And so what's he saying? Well, like King David, the Messiah is going to be a descendant of David's father, Jesse. And so when you go and look at, at Jesus' genealogy in Matthew chapter 1, verse 6, is it true? Is he a descendant of Jesse? Go like this. Yeah, that's true as well. Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, out of Egypt, I called my son, which foreshadows a Messiah who's going to live for a season in Egypt and then come back, which is exactly what we see in Matthew chapter 2. Even Jeremiah chapter 31 talks about what's getting ready to happen after Jesus is born. It says, A voice is heard in Ramah, mourning and great weeping. Rachel, weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Which is a reference to what King Herod is getting ready to do when Jesus comes into the world. Where all boys, two years of age and younger in Bethlehem, are ordered to be killed in an effort to suppress this newborn king that everybody seems to be talking about. Which again, is right here in Matthew chapter 2, verse 18. So, when it comes to understanding why Matthew begins the way Matthew begins, one commentator puts it like this. He says, the literary genre of these chapters is designed to bring out the deeper meaning of the present by showing its theological continuity with the past. I know much, you know, kind of big words and so on, but the point is, it's, it's meant to connect to everything we've been reading up until this point. He says, Matthew's procedure is to set the scene theologically by identifying the who and the how in chapter one and the where and the whence in chapter two. Uh, others would look at Matthew and say, oh, well, well Matthew is, is really here to demonstrate the Jewishness of Jesus. And they're right. Uh, perhaps my favorite comes from my, my friend Bobby Valentine, who describes Matthew 1 and 2 as, as something like a zipper. You picture like a zipper that kind of comes together. It's like a zipper that brings together all of these long promised uh, truths of the Hebrew scriptures in perfect unity with all of the fulfilled truths that we get in the new covenant that the Messiah brings. And so, you cannot appreciate the master class that is Matthew 1 and 2 without all the hard work of everything that we've been doing for the last 30 weeks. There's a purpose behind why we read everything that we just read for seven plus months. And yet as profound and important as all of those hyperlinks, those callbacks, if you will, were, that's not even my favorite. That's not even my favorite in Matthew because more subtly there lurking beneath the surface of the story is the way in which Jesus' entire beginning of life narrative kind of mimics or parallels the story of God's people Israel. I don't know if how many of you have ever realized this. Just like Israel, Jesus' story begins in this promised land of Canaan. Or as Muhammad likes to say, how do you say it, Muhammad? Canaan, right? Just like Israel, God speaks to a man named Joseph through dreams and brings Jesus to Egypt to escape disaster. Just like Israel, Jesus is eventually brought back to the land from Egypt. And just like Israel, Jesus begins his mission by passing through the waters in Matthew chapter 3 in baptism and then into the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4 right? Where he's tempted. And so when Jesus begins his ministry and begins to preach in Matthew chapter 5 and says things like, hey, do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to what? Say it louder. Fulfill them. For truly I tell you until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law 
until everything is accomplished. Church, Matthew wants the reader to see and understand and have confidence beyond the shadow of a doubt that Jesus is indeed the long-awaited Messiah of God, that Jesus is the one. Jesus is the one. And here's why that matters. Because beyond the tension of this story that asks, hey, is Jesus the one, is a tension of a different kind. Or, or perhaps more accurately, I could say, the tension of a different king. Look at Matthew chapter 2. Matthew 2 begins in verse 1 with these words. That after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, just like the prophet said, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and they asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and we've come to worship him. Now, I don't know if you're thinking this or not, but if you are, it's worth asking, if this is supposed to be the Roman Empire, then who is this King Herod guy? Because he's certainly not Caesar, right? Caesar's supposed to be king. And you're right. That's a decent question if you're asking that. And the short answer is that much like his father Antipater, Herod is, is actually more of an overseer of the region under Roman rule. And so he, he might be something more comparable to like a governor in, in our culture today. And so he had one single loyalty, and that loyalty was to the Roman Empire. But in that region where he lived, in Judea, where he functioned, he functioned very much as the final say on whatever it was that happened unless Rome kind of came in and overruled him. But, but Herod had become this maniacal, obsessive leader. He was, he was so obsessed with trying to maintain his, the security of his rule. And so one commentator in, in Anchor Bible Dictionary uh, talks about Herod this way. He says that Herod exercised complete control over his realm by dominating all key institutions, that no matter was beyond his scrutiny. He looked at the highest tribunal, which was the Sanhedrin, like the Jewish court system, he said that was merely now a rubber stamp for the king's wishes. He would summon it whenever it suited the king, and it was a group that consisted primarily, if not exclusively, of Herod himself, his friends, and his relatives. And he continues, even the high priesthood was another institution that was manipulated by Herod for his own purposes, because Herod realized from the outset that control of this office was crucial for a successful reign. And it is for this reason that he immediately installed his longtime friend, Hananel of Babylonia, as high priest. So he's going around as leader, and he's plugging in all of his loyal people into all of these, these Jewish religious authority positions. And what I want you to see is that not only was Herod in complete political control in the region, but by installing his friends and his family into the, into the courts and even as high priest, he controlled all of the religious authority in the land as well. Are you with me so far? Okay. So, how do you think a guy like that reacts when all of a sudden these magi from the east show up and they ask him, hey, Herod, where is the king of the Jews? What do you think he's saying? He's like, what are you talking about? I am the king of the Jews. What are you talking about? And so verse 3 of Matthew 2 says, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed but not just him, who else was disturbed? All Jerusalem with him. And so what does Herod do in verse 4? He calls all the religious leaders, all the people who are loyal to him, people who know the law, people who know what the prophets said, people who ought to be eagerly expecting a Messiah, but somehow aren't. And he begins to scheme for how to eliminate this threat to his kingship. And what I want you to see perhaps more than anything else in Matthew chapter 1 and 2 is the tension between two kings and two kingdoms. Because that is precisely, I think, where the gospel begins to intersect our world and our lives today. That, that much like Malachi last week confronted us with the, the sobering reality that God would one day bring a messenger, and that messenger's job would be to make a distinction between those who honored God and those who didn't, those who knew God and those who didn't. The tension in Matthew between King Herod and this little baby King Jesus, King of the Jews, is the lingering question, like, is Jesus the one? Is he the king? Is he the one? 
And what's interesting in this brief story is that two different groups of people make their choice, or they, they answer that question differently. On one hand, you have these likely pagan, non-believing magi, or you'd think they were non-believing, who come from the east, come to Jerusalem where King Herod is, and King Herod asks them to search for the child and report back to him. But instead, what do they do? They go and they bring gifts and they honor Jesus as king. And then they blow off King Herod and they escape and they go home to their homeland. And on the other hand, you have the Jewish chief priests, the Jewish teachers of the law, the, the descendants of Abraham, of Jacob, of, of Judah, just like Jesus is, who instead offer their loyalty to who? Say King Herod. And not only that, King Herod is not even Jewish. He's practicing, but he's not born into that family. Uh, kind of confusing words here, but King Herod is actually Idumean, which is kind of a fancy way of saying he comes from the line of Esau. You remember last week in Malachi, what we talked about between the tension between Jacob and Esau? God said, hey, between Jacob and Esau, I favored who? Jacob, right? And so Esau and his, and his lineage was kind of always the forever enemies of God's people. And that's who Herod comes from. In other words, the people who theoretically should not choose Jesus as king do, while those who should theoretically choose Jesus as king choose who? They choose Herod. There's a commentator named D.A. Hagner who kind of looks at this dichotomy between Herod and Jesus. And I think with, with Malachi's kind of distinction language very much in the background, and he says that the message of the gospel demands decision. It demands decision and it necessitates a division between those who accept and reject that message. And he says it's a motif that will occupy the entire Matthew account. And so again, the question that confronts us is four simple words. Is Jesus the one? Is he really the one? And the reality for us, church, is that it's, it's still a question that we all must be confronted with even to this very day because it's a question that confronts every other relationship that we have in our world today. It's a question that confronts our relationship with our spouse. It's a question that confronts our relationship with our careers. It's a question that confronts our relationship with our country. It's a question that confronts our relationship with political leaders and celebrities and so many other people. I want you to realize that every single chief priest, every single teacher of the law, if asked, just like us, would have claimed with their mouths that Yahweh God was king of their lives. But what did their actions suggest about who their real king was? They chose who? Say his name. Say Herod. <laughs> They chose Herod. There are no shortage of people in our world today who profess to follow Jesus, who happily call him Christ and Messiah, who show up to, to worship him each and every Sunday morning, who read and who know God's word and the Bible inside and out, and yet deep down in their heart of hearts, when confronted between the intangible king of kings in scripture and the tangible king right in front of them, day after day after day, choose and surrender to the wrong king. Scores of people do this every day. And so kind of coming back to that map quest language of, of the, the, the ways and the routes that we, we have an opportunity to follow, we recognize that there's, there's a split in the road up ahead. And, and we, we have to choose which way we go. We can choose to go left. We can choose to go right. But can we go down both roads at the same time? Go like this. We can't. We have to choose one or the other. And so the question is, which way will you choose? Will, will you choose the ways and the kings of this world? Or will you choose Jesus? Will you choose the king of kings who calls himself the way, the truth, and the life, and who reminds us that no man comes to the Father except through him. 
Jesus says in Matthew 7, he says, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. And so when the road splits, and it will split, which way will you choose? Will you choose the way of Jesus? I want you to ask yourself that question. And then I want you to answer honestly to yourself. Is Jesus the one? Is he the one in my life? Is he, is he the only one in my life? Because this morning we invite you to, to make Jesus king of your life. Jesus says over and over and over again, all you have to do is ask. All you have to do is seek. All you have to do is knock and you will find him. But you cannot have it both ways. You cannot choose him and Herod. You can't do it. Jesus says you cannot serve two masters. So the question is, is Jesus the one? Is he the one master of your life? If you can't choose two, is he the one? If you've not chosen Jesus as king of your life and would like to this morning, I want to invite you to do that. I want to invite you to make him your Lord and your king today. You can be baptized into him, into his death, into his burial, and into his resurrection, and you can be raised again to a new life in him. And as you reflect on that question, I want, to, I want us to watch a short video. Um, and we're going we're gonna to watch it, and then we're going to sing a final song. And if at any point during the video or the song you would like to speak with me about something that's on your heart, I'm going to sit right up here in the front row. I invite you, or you can talk to me in the courtyard after service today. But here's a story of one Jewish man who dared to open the Gospel of Matthew, who dared to open the New Testament and see what it was all about. And it changed his life. Let's watch. Growing up, we always understood that we had our Bible and the Gentiles had their Bible in the New Testament and that they were two completely separate books because the only people I knew who were believers in Jesus were all people in our public school who were Italian Catholic. I imagined that Jesus was Italian. And so the understanding that he's actually Jewish was, was a shock. And then to hear that the New Testament was written by Jews, I, I couldn't believe it. My expectation was that the New Testament was like my grandparents had told me. It was a, a book on how to persecute the Jews and something you should stay away from. Of course, when you're told you should stay away from something, <laughs> curiosity gets the best of you and you've got to see it. When I opened the New Testament, I was expecting to find a handbook on how to persecute the Jews. My grandparents had warned me that it was written by people who killed the Jews. That's what I was expecting to see, and yet when I'm opening it, I'm reading a story written by Jews about Jewish people. The New Testament was a fascinating book. And so as I opened this book in the library, I kind of looked around, made sure that none of my friends had seen me taking a Christian Bible off the shelf. And I open it, here's the first sentence. It says, this is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So three people are mentioned and they're all Jewish. I was very shocked. And as I continue to read, I'm reading the story of a Jewish man who was born in a Jewish village, in a Jewish country, and one day walks into a synagogue and announces that he is the Messiah. The more I read the words of Jesus, the more I became attracted to him. It was as beautiful as anything I had ever read in any other part of the Bible. As I came to faith that Yeshua, that Jesus was the Messiah, it was clear that that was the most Jewish thing I could do. This is not the person who's a renegade to our people. This is the one who was promised in our Bible, the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. It is astonishing. If you would just read that chapter, just without the Bible being around it, you would say, oh, this is some Christian Bible. This is Jesus. <laughs> when you realize, though, that it's in the middle of our Bible, our Jewish Bible. When I first came to faith, I dared not tell my father, uh, because this is a time period in the, 
the 1970s when there were lots of gurus and cults. And he was very concerned about me getting involved in some crazy sect and going off someplace. So I waited for months. And uh, when I finally told him, he was very skeptical. On his own then, he started to read about Jesus as well. About a year and a half later, I told him that the fellow who wrote one of the books that he had read, that this fellow was giving a lecture in the city of New York. And he agreed to come out to hear that person. And uh, one of the most amazing moments of my life was, the speaker said, would everyone here who is a Jewish believer in Jesus, would you raise your hand? And I raised my hand. My father also raised his hand. And I said, I looked over, I said, Pop, he didn't say would all the Jews raise their hand. He said, would all the Jewish believers in Jesus raise their hand? And my father looked over and he said, yes, I, I heard what he said. The decision to come to faith in Jesus as the Messiah was not something that was a momentary lark. It wasn't something that was a passing fad. And I could see changes in myself that I knew were not from within myself. I had kind of tapped in to a truth for our Jewish people that was very powerful.